Um, I'm um, Nick Stern. I'm the IG Patel Professor of Economics and Government here and, and uh, President of the British Academy. Um, we're very happy to have with us two people of extraordinary distinction, um, Adair Turner and John Brown. Adair is uh, uh, many things, so I'm going to introduce Adair because Adair is the chair for today. Um, but he will get a short introduction from me. But I did want to say at the beginning that um, it is not, not the tradition of the LSE to dwell on agreement. So I hope there will be some robust questioning. That's who we are. That's our style. It's also the tradition of the LSE to respect our speakers and to engage in serious argument and serious discussion about serious issues. And I hope that you will follow that tradition as well. Indeed, I'm confident that you will follow that tradition as well. Now, Adair, Lord uh, Turner, um, has many careers, and I'm not going to list them all. He has been Director General of the Confederation of British Industry. He has been Chair of the Climate Change Committee. He has uh, been Chair of the UK Financial Services Authority. He has now uh, become a full-time, he's always been an intellectual, but he's become a full-time intellectual. At, as a senior fellow of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. He is, with myself, a trustee of the British Museum, and I should note that John Brown has been a trustee of the British Museum um, for 10 years. He stepped down six or seven years ago, so we have uh, a great uh, love for that establishment in common. But we have a lot of other things in common, too. But Adair, could you take over, please? Nick, thank you, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it really is a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Lord Brown, John Brown, uh, to give uh, this lecture uh, this evening. I think he is a, a brilliantly placed to talk about uh, the subject of the challenge of uh, climate change uh, in a period of, as he would argue, uh, fossil fuel uh, abundance. And uh, a, that abundance actually creates its, its own challenges uh, rather than necessarily a, uh, being a, at all a useful set of developments. John is brilliantly well qualified to talk to this uh, issue. Uh, he clearly has a huge experience uh, in uh, the energy industry. He had a long-term career uh, at uh, British Petroleum, ending as Group Chief Executive uh, for all the way from 1998 uh, to 2007. Uh, he's now uh, heavily involved in private equity business in a company called Riverstone Holdings, which has large investments in the energy industry, and he has a whole series of other activities as well as the UK government's lead non-executive board member, uh, chairman of the trustees of the Tate Gallery, uh, and also a crossbench uh, member of the House of Lords. Indeed, you have in front of you three crossbench members of the House of Lords, um, and a, uh, I don't know what, that, uh, what the collective phrase uh, for three crossbench members is, uh, but some category of triplet. Uh, but John's... Old, uh, old men, I think. Oh, <laughs> John's uh, uh, background, I think, gives him a huge expertise in the energy industry, but he's also someone uh, who, over uh, the last 15 to 20 years, and beginning in a very important speech that he gave in, I think it was 1997, really pushed forward to say that the energy industry had to take very seriously the challenge of climate change. And he did that from a position of Group Chief, Chief Executive of BP, uh, which was really a great breach with uh, what until then had been the predominant attitude of uh, the oil industry. It's an area that he has been fascinated with and put a lot of thought into uh, ever since. And as I say, I think he is brilliantly qualified to deal with this fascinating and extremely important issue. So John, let me you. hand over to you. General, good evening. It's a very great pleasure to be at the LSE. Uh, as Adair said, uh, when I'd been the chief executive of BP for just a couple of years, I broke ranks with the rest of the energy industry. In 1997, I stood under 
what was then a blazing Californian sun at Stanford University, where regrettably I was educated, I wasn't educated here, uh, and explained that BP acknowledged the risk posed by climate change, accepted that it was a result of human activity, and wanted to do something about it. I was asked by other chief executives at the time whether I'd lost the plot. The American Petroleum Institute accused me of leaving the church, whatever that meant. And some NGOs accused us of greenwash, assuming that we were trying to distract attention from our core business. Ten years later, in 2007, I stood in the same place and reaffirmed BP's commitment to the fight against damaging climate change. It was a matter of months before the beginning of the Great Recession, during which climate change seemed a more peripheral concern than ever. That same year, production of shale gas in the United States would take off, turning North America from a major energy importer to a country considering the prospect of energy self-sufficiency and postponing, perhaps, forever, worries about peak oil and gas. And just four days after that speech, I resigned from BP. I said in 1997 uh, that the time to consider the policy dimensions of climate change is not when the link between greenhouse gases and climate is conclusively proven, but when the possibility can't be discounted. That time came for BP in 97, and we started to take action. Some governments and businesses were already doing so, and by the time I reaffirmed BP's commitment in 2007, climate change was then a key concern for almost all private and public policy makers. That's led to some remarkable successes. When it comes to the science, the level of uncertainty about mankind's influence on the climate is decreasing. Climate science will always be a science, a study of probabilities, characterized by the scientist Stephen Schneiders uh, as a system science, not a test tube science. But where the IPCC once talked about merely a discernible human influence on the climate, it now has enough evidence to identify clear human influences as the dominant cause of recent warming. <coughs> as our understanding of man-made climate change has improved, so have the low-carbon technologies which could provide solutions. Biomass is now a practical alternative to coal. The cost of wind and solar technologies has fallen dramatically, and the energy intensity of the world's GDP has continued to fall by an average of 1% a year for the past two decades. So these improvements in science and technology have delivered measurable results. Global renewable energy capacity almost doubled over the 12 years that I was chief executive of BP, but it's more than doubled in the six years since I left. The growth in carbon dioxide emissions is slowing, and the emissions in OECD countries are falling. So our response to climate change has delivered some real successes. But those successes should not breed complacency. Global emissions are still rising, and the concerns about the cost of decarbonisation are growing. Any problem of risk management requires us continuously to update our responses in the light of new information about what works and what doesn't work. We now have at least two decades of experience on which to draw, and I think the time is right to re-examine, reassess, and rejuvenate our attempts at tackling the existentially important question of climate change. And I think that means doing four things. First, we need targets and commitment mechanisms which provide stable and credible incentives for action. Second, we need to find a new balance in the way we support the development 
of low carbon technologies and energies. Third, we must devote more time and resources to the study of human behavior, a mechanism for change which remains hugely underexplored. And fourth, we need to pay greater attention to the public's perception and understanding of the energy mix. Those four opportunities for change should ref be reflected in a modern set of energy and climate policies. So let me begin with the need for clear and credible carbon reduction targets. Whether in business or public policy, it's the job of a leader to set the direction of travel. Targets are a critical part of that because they provide a goal and a benchmark against which to measure progress. The world doesn't lack emissions reduction targets. The Kyoto Protocol, for example, gave countries individual targets and set up annual negotiations to renew them. The USA and the EU have set their own targets, and even China is aiming for ambitious reductions in energy intensity. But to be effective, targets have to be taken seriously, seriously by voters, by consumers, but most importantly, by the businesses which will invest in the solutions. That investment will only come from confidence, certainty, and objectives which provide clear mechanisms to increase shareholder value. Over the past two decades, the world has not always provided that sort of environment. And so we're not making full use of the enormous power and resources that businesses have to implement change. Take the annual meetings of the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework on Conventions on Climate Change. This year's meeting gave unprecedented prominence to the role that business can play. And the UK's climate change minister, Greg Barker, rightly stressed that decarbonisation will only happen with the support of business. But annual negotiations continue to seek consensus among almost 200 parties, and the incentives to adhere to targets are weak. With that in mind, the UNFCCC is unlikely to provide the stable and credible framework which businesses need to act. Credibility also goes hand in hand with stability at the national level. If governments develop a track record of instability by changing the rules of the game, this will be reflected in the risk that businesses face and the cost of capital for low carbon investors, making decarbonisation more expensive and less complete. And I've seen the effects of instability firsthand. My private equity firm is an investor in solar power company in Spain, where the government has behaved recklessly by imposing retroactive tariff cuts and failing to adhere to the International Energy Charter, doing great damage to its reputation amongst investors. Credibility also comes from consistency. Decarbonisation targets are questioned when it's clear that incentives exist both to remove carbon from the energy system, but also to produce and consume it. In 2011, the UK spent over £4 billion supporting the production and consumption of oil and gas, more than is spent to support renewable energy. In the US, production tax credits for renewable energy exist alongside $13 billion of support for fossil fuels. And across the OECD region, around $80 billion of public money is spent every year to support the production of carbon-based fuels. It's a bit like running both the heating and the air conditioning at the same time. These arrangements are neither sensible nor sustainable. Targets and frameworks do, need, do not need to be rigid and unchanging, but they do need to remain credible over the relevant time framework for low carbon investors. Actions or rhetoric which create risk and instability will make decarbonisation an even more distant goal. 
My second point is about the use of public resources for decarbonisation. I think the experience of the last two decades shows that we need to find a new balance between public investment in technology, subsidies for low carbon energy and market-based solutions for climate change. In spite of its imperfections, the market remains the most powerful force for carbon reduction. And that force has been demonstrated with greatest effect in the United States, where rising oil and gas prices of the past two decades created the incentives to both develop more hydrocarbons and to use less of them. That eventually led to the commercialization of vast reserves of unconventional oil and gas, and it contributed to huge improvements in energy efficiency, particularly in the transportation sector. The average new American vehicle is now three times as efficient as it was 40 years ago, and by 2025, they're required to be 65% more efficient still. As a result, US oil consumption has been on decline and is declining. Coal is being replaced by cheaper, cleaner, and more abundant natural gas, and carbon dioxide emissions are back to levels last seen in 1994. Perhaps most significantly, almost all new US electric power generation capacity over the next decade is expected to come from gas or renewables. Now those developments were driven by market forces, but they were also supported by government regulation and investment. Stringent fuel economy standards provided a credible set of targets, and the US government contributed almost $100 million to critical research in the application of hydraulic fracturing. A combination of wise, enlightened regulation, public money and market forces created the conditions for change. Carbon dioxide emissions fell because dirtier fuels became more expensive, cleaner fuels became cheaper, and investment in energy efficiency offered attractive returns. In contrast, carbon dioxide emissions in Europe are rising because the EU emissions trading scheme hasn't provided the right market signals for widespread decarbonisation, and because the dirtiest fuels are the cheapest. In the UK, for example, coal is around 70% cheaper than gas on an energy equivalent basis. As a result, the portion of our electricity generated from coal is now the highest since 1996, while the portion generated from gas is at its lowest since the same year. A fully functioning global carbon market must remain the long-term goal. It would ensure that the true environmental cost of every fuel is reflected in its price in all markets, so that no country dents its competitive advantage. But at the moment, that's a long-term aspiration, which may not deliver results before it's too late. The damaging potential of climate change is too big for us to target the theoretically perfect at the expense of the practically possible. We should therefore focus our efforts on an intelligent combination of public investment, technology improvement, and market forces. And that should begin by using public money to support technology in preference to the production of energy. By some estimates, every pound of public investment in research and development stimulates up to five pounds of public funding. In the UK, though, we'll spend just over £3 billion this year on subsidising the production of low-carbon energy, but around one-tenth of that on support for long-term innovation and improvement in low-carbon technologies. Public funding programmes, which extend beyond the next election, are very limited. Those priorities should be rebalanced. Subsidies which support the output of renewable technologies should continue to play a role. But without careful design, they run the risk of prolonging inefficiencies, removing the incentive for technological progress and diverting resources from more productive ends. They're also powerless to stop the substitution of coal for gas, which has contributed to recent increases in carbon dioxide emissions. 
Investment in technology is not without its risks, and it still requires the government to make practical choices, which in a theoretical world would be made by the market. But investment in technology represents an investment in the economy's productive capacity, an investment which encourages low-carbon technologies to compete without public support in the future. <coughs> I'm the co-head of a £4.5 billion private equity renewable energy fund, the largest in the world. And I've seen firsthand the power of technological improvement and the successes and failures of different renewable energy technologies. One of the most remarkable successes has indeed come from solar power. The cost of solar modules has fallen by 80% over the past five years, contributing a 60% fall in the cost of electricity that are produced by them. And that's becoming competitive without subsidies. Solar panels require little upfront capital expenditure before they start to produce electricity, and they're well suited for distributed electric power generation. Public support should go to a wide range of low carbon technologies, including measures aimed at adaptation and geoengineering. But an approach focused on low carbon technologies with proven potential could achieve something really remarkable. For example, and just as an example, a global grand challenge aimed at stimulating research into solar generation and electric storage technologies combined with investment in infrastructure could transform our journey to a low carbon future. <coughs> developments in energy supply must be matched by developments in demand. And that's going to require a new focus on the understanding of human behavior, my third point this evening. At BP, we identified a huge desire amongst our staff to tackle the problem of the climate. And that became the driving force behind many changes that were made. Those who worked there had lives not just within the company, but also as citizens and parents. And many of them were scientists and engineers, including some of the best, in my view, in the world. They read the evidence and they were asked why, and they asked why as a company we were trying to ignore that evidence. In my experience, the only way to reduce carbon dioxide emissions is to win the rational commercial argument, and then to focus on the deeper motivations behind people's actions. Of course, actions have to make commercial sense, but leaders also need to bring people with them. By 2001, in BP, we'd reduced our carbon dioxide emissions by 10% below their 1990 level, not just because they saved money, but because it was something our people were proud to do. An understanding of human behavior was critical in the transformation of BP, and it should now play a key role in modern public policy response to climate change. Over two centuries ago, as many people know, Stanley Jevons identified the implications of human behavior for the energy industry. He argued that efficiency went hand in hand with growing consumption, as we enthusiastically consume more for our money. By the same token, humans have a habit of rewarding their success at con conservation with greater consumption. The installation of more efficient light bulbs, for example, might be met with the reward of a second refrigerator in the garage or an extra degree on the thermostat. Studies of human behavior tell us that really smart technology needs to be able to override our consuming instincts. It's well known that humans are not willing to make economically rational investments if they involve immediate costs or debt followed by long-term and uncertain gains. If policies like the Green Deal are to be successful, we need to go beyond arguments based on probability and possibility alone. A truly radical policy would uh, award financial benefits to consumers 
who take any sort of action to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions. That might put a greater strain on public finances, and it would disproportionately reward those who have the money to invest, but it would be the most direct way of stimulating changes in the way we consume energy. The behavior of the irrational consumer has moved up the agenda, and that is gradually leading to more intelligent approaches. Utility companies, for example, are beginning to realize that peer pressure can be just as a powerful force for change as price or technology. More government policies are now designed to exploit human behavior, and that approach should now be extended to energy and climate policies. But our understanding of this behavior is actually in its infancy, and its transformative potential remains largely untapped. And that's why I'm certainly going to support uh, opportunities for research through my own foundation to see how we can sponsor some research and research fellows in this field. With greater support and attention, I'm optimistic that the study of behavioral economics and psychology could make a real difference to carbon dioxide emissions and bring huge benefits at next to no cost. Human behavior also plays a key part in the final point I want to make this evening. It's not related to energy supply, demand or investment, but to public perception and understanding of the energy mix. Education, communication, and credible persuasion must all play critical roles in the new energy and climate policies. Take uh, nuclear power, for example. In spite of the accidents which loom large in our collective memory, it is a fact that the safest form of energy, with fewer direct fatalities than any other energy source, is nuclear. In the developing world, coal has been around 12 times as deadly per unit of energy produced, a figure which rises dramatically if we look at China alone. Gas has been twice as deadly, oil almost 20 times as deadly, and perhaps rather surprisingly, hydroelectric power is more than 200 times as deadly as nuclear power. Even deaths caused over the long term from accidental radiation are estimated to be far fewer than those caused by the side effects of fossil fuels. But in spite of that evidence, nuclear power <coughs> conjures widespread fear and dread. And despite, or perhaps because, it is the safest, nuclear power is now one of the most expensive forms of energy, and its future looks bleak. That sort of misunderstanding extends across the energy mix. The IEA recently noted that to prevent damaging levels of global warming, the world can only afford to emit another 900 gigatons of carbon dioxide between now and 2050, equivalent to one third of the world's proven fossil fuel reserves. And that's proved to be a powerful slogan for some campaign groups who remind us that two-thirds of the world's fossil fuel reserves must stay in the ground. But that simple analysis fails to distinguish between different types of fossil fuel in different places. We could, in fact, burn all the world's proven gas reserves and spend just 40% of our carbon budget, burn just half the world's coal reserves, however, and we would emit over 2,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide more than twice the carbon <laughs> budget. Not all hydrocarbons were created equal, and a failure to tell people about these differences threatens to distract us from the development of an affordable, reliable, and environmentally sound energy mix. And I speak here as chairman of Quadrilla, a firm at the forefront of shale gas exploration in the UK. I expect some people think I've left the church again, or that I've re-entered a very old church. But as long as wells are designed to keep methane leakage to a minimum, the cleanest hydrocarbon <coughs> is in fact natural gas, as it emits half the carbon dioxide of coal, 
when burned efficiently to generate electricity. The safe and cost-effective development of the world's vast gas reserves, including shale gas, must therefore be a critical part of the battle against dangerous climate change, providing that gas displaces coal and that it eventually gives way to a completely decarbonized energy mix. Shale gas is already having a positive effect on the world's climate in the United States, where carbon dioxide emissions have fallen by more than 10% over the past five years. It clearly has the potential to do the same <coughs> elsewhere, in particular in Europe, where coal consumption is rising. And most importantly, it could drastically reduce the carbon intensity of future economic growth in China and India, which could be decisive in limiting the rise in global temperatures to safe and manageable levels. A misplaced fear and dread threaten to prevent this. Fears of water contamination, for example, are a prime reason for opposition to hydraulic fracturing. But in fact, according to the US Secretary of Energy, there are no known cases of groundwater contamination as a direct result of the hydraulic fracking process. <coughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a subject that uh, people can ask questions sure on later. <laughs> we'll take the value of local residents' houses from Aberdeen to North Dakota. The evidence demonstrates that wherever the oil and gas industry leads, leads there is a thriving local economy and house prices go up rather than go down. But we have a tendency we have a tendency to focus on coughing, I know. But we have a tendency also to focus on perceived potential for catastrophe rather than the evidence. Operators, regulators, and credible third parties must therefore make a concerted effort to remind people of the proven and positive impact of technologies like hydraulic fracturing. But then we will need to go beyond the evidence. Energy is about vision, purpose, and trust. We know that a radically new level of external engagement is the only way to build the strong and sustainable relationships with local communities which the energy industry requires. That means transparency about operations, consultation at every stage of a company's working processes, and supreme clarity of vision and purpose. And that sort of external engagement is the only way to earn the public's confidence. We must replace fear and dread with education, communication, evidence, and trust. In 1998, NASA scientist James Hansen testified between, before the United States Senate, telling the world that the greenhouse effect was changing the climate. The author, Rupert Darwall, labels Hansen's testimony, the start of global warming, as a political phenomenon, a turning point in the history of science and the start of a new chapter in the affairs of mankind. 25 years later, it's time to begin writing the next chapter with new authors, new energy, and a new sense of purpose. And that requires us to recognize what's worked and what hasn't worked, and to adopt a rational, considered approach to rebalancing the sources of energy which determine our carbon output. There is absolutely no magic bullet. But consistent targets, investment in technology, changes to human behavior, and, approach, and an approach based on evidence rather than impression would unlock a cost-effective route to a low-carbon future, and eventually to a no-carbon future. We must aim for an intelligent reassessment of the fight against dangerous climate change and a great rejuvenation of our efforts to battle this potentially existential threat. Thanks to the potential of science, technology, and engineering, I wasn't pessimistic in 1997, and nor was I in 2007, and for the very same reasons, I'm not pessimistic now either. Thank you very much.
John, thank you very much for a very thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, speech, which I think has given uh, everybody a, all sorts of issues to uh, debate. Now, the good news is we have got a full 50 minutes now, to, from now till 8 o'clock, to have a uh, discussion and to ask questions. What I'm going to do in a minute is ask for questions from the floor, and I'm going to take them in groups of three. And I will be asking you, try and make it brief, try and make it a question, not a speech. Though obviously you can put a bit of background in, but I will have to control that to a degree. Um, when you ask uh, a question, can you please say who you are and if it's relevant, you know, w what is your affiliation? Um, but actually, we're going to start, I'm going to ask a question and then uh, Nick is going to ask a question to get us rolling. And my first question, uh, John, really wants to pick up this, uh, this issue of gas. I'm going to leave to those on the floor um, the details of fracking because we clear to have uh, some people who uh, uh, will clearly want to ask questions of that. My, my question is about gas in general. When you said that a cost effective development of the world's vast gas reserves was a critical part. You very clearly said, providing that gas displaces coal and that it eventually gives way to a completely decarbonised energy mix. So my question is, do you have a vision of when that transition beyond gas occurs and how confident we can be that it will occur? Because when we were at the Climate Change Committee, when I chaired it, we argued that the decarbonisation of electricity in particular was such a vital part of getting to a low carbon economy that we really had to have very stretching targets to bring, uh, a, say, the carbon intensity of electricity down to something like 30 or 40 grams per kilowatt hour as early as 2030. Now, if that is the case, you can't have much gas in the system because gas is roughly 300 grams per kilowatt hour, much better than coal at 600 grams per kilowatt hour, but still not as low as we need. And I know that the, uh, the International Energy Agency has talked about an energy mix which is compatible with what we need to do on the climate, involving gas, as it were, declining beyond 2025, I believe is the figure they suggested. So my question to you is, given that you said, provided that it eventually gives way to a completely decarbonised energy mix, how long do you think this transitional period of gas is? What are the policies we ensure we come out of it quickly? And are there any dangers that this very process of investing in gas creates some, you know, some capacity which, once it's there, we'll then feel we have to run for longer than makes sense to the climate. How do you get that transition beyond gas? So I think um, I've, since I've been in the you and I have been in the forecasting business as Nick has for a very long time, I think the one thing we know for sure is that all the forecasts are always wrong, in particular in this area. And the reason for it is the system is simply too complex. We don't understand what happens to the world economy, let alone a sub part of it, which is the energy economy. So I think, first of all, we must retain options. I think it's very important. And secondly, the UK is not the only place. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, to displace coal widely in the world uh, would, of course, mean China in particular, uh, as well as India. And I think that will make very big differences indeed. But I do think that uh, I can't tell when the uh, transition will take place. But what I can say is that without gas as part of that transition, it won't take place at all. So we need some gas the whole time, and we need to commit to it. Not all of it will disappear at once. Some of it will disappear. We need to understand how to phase it out very carefully. And it will be different in each country. Nick. Um, John, could I add my thanks to those of um, Adair for a very thoughtful um, uh, lecture. And uh, I also wanted to add um, a welcome from um, the Grantham Institute on Climate Change and the Environment, which, as you know, has been a part of the organization of this. And your research areas or your areas to think about, uh, the four areas you described, are very much part of the research story of um, Grantham. So what I wanted to do was to uh, pick just one of those, because obviously there are too many to get into just one question. Uh, but on what Adair just said, I, I know that uh, some of us tried very hard to get the um, uh, emissions per unit of kilowatt hour amendment into the energy bill. We just failed. Um, but we did succeed in the House of Lords in um, putting uh, 
a limit on um, energy per unit, sorry, emissions per unit of out, output or kilowatt hour um, from a generation source, which would essentially uh, eliminate coal from the mix or unabated coal from the mix by 2030. And that was the Teverson Amendment, which did pass in the House of Lords. We're in danger of ping pong with the Commons now, but that's something that we should look out for. But he here's my question. Um, the uh, emissions per unit of output are going um, down by ball ballpark 1%. Uh, that has to be 5% over most of this century if we're to have much chance of holding to two degrees with a reasonable probability. So it, it underlines very strongly the need to accelerate and that has to be executed through energy efficiency, of course, which is extremely important, and you emphasize that very strongly. But also discovering um, uh, lower cost ways of doing low carbon yes. energy, uh, low carbon electricity, but low carbon energy more generally. And I wonder if you could help us with your thoughts on how much of that you'd expect to be R&D, and I don't expect that to be directly quantitative, but it's the balance between um, the research side and the deployment side, because so much of what we learn is deployment. And one of the reasons we support things like feed-in tariffs is they get deployment out there quickly, and through that deployment process you learn like mad. Now, that's a, a complementary kind of learning to the more uh, thoughtful, lab-based, uh, you know, dreaming up something which is completely different. And we clearly need both. But I would be very grateful for your thoughts on, in order to get that em emissions unit of uh, output falling at 5% a year, how do we combine the deployment story, which gives us so much learning, which can be quite expensive, with the R&D story? Well, I think it's no different in, in any major pursuit that affects humans. I mean, I would argue the same in medicine, where you have to do an awful lot before you deploy safely, uh, but you will learn a lot as you deploy the technologies. Uh, and so I think the same is true here. I think it's quite remarkable that energy is probably the world's largest business, I think, uh, and we're dealing with numbers like 300 million pounds. I think if we were thinking about another business, let's say IT or, or medicine, I think we'd be talking about very much bigger numbers, uh, very much bigger percentage uh, contributions in the public purse, without wanting to go into the details of exactly what it is. I think the main point, though, is this is so central to the change in the way in which we will live that we should think about exploit, exploring more and more unusual technologies as well as deploying many of them to get the learning curve from deployment. So if you take solar, for example, we're stuck with roughly the same technologies that have been around for kind of 100 years, plus or minus. Uh, we need, I think, to think of something very, very different to see if we can make another major breakthrough in cost, which isn't just about the manufacturing learning curve, mm. which is what the cost reduction is at the moment, as an example. Good. Right. Now, let's take some questions. I see a lot of hands, and I'm going to try. I'm going to start right up at the back with uh, the chap in a stripy jersey. Then I'm going to go to the lady over the front and a gentleman over there who has been had his hand up for some time. So, over, first up there. Uh, we have, should have time for lots of questions, but and be as quick as possible, and we'll okay, take them in I'll be quick. Yep. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm Alex Bozun Wang from uh, UCL Energy Institute. And given that the topic is the climate change uh, in an age of the fossil fuel abundance, and I actually honestly quite uh, surprised that you didn't mention carbon capture and storage even once. Uh, so I'm wondering, you, you did emphasize the, the importance for uh, the uh, carbon, uh, carbon reduction in China and India, which is the two largest uh, CO2 emitter currently, but you, also, you, you even compared it for the shale gas, which we all know they have the potential pollution issues and the water competition issues. But you still think uh, the CCS is uh, compared with shale gas is less, pro uh, less possible for these two countries? 
Oh, uh, my question is, do you have some comments on this issue? Thank you. Right, so you're interested in carbon capture and storage, including for coal, by the sound of it. Is yeah, that right? Yeah, definitely. Co coal as well as gas, yes. And in the front here. Yeah. My name is Vanessa Vine. I live four miles from Balkan, where the company in which you personally, sir, are deeply invested, which has a 50% failure rate already on its wells in Lancashire, seeks to frack the aquifer, potentially. You have given an eminently, ostensibly plausible speech and a deeply disingenuous one by which I feel personally patronised. I would like to ask you, in all your apparent championing of green issues and philanthropy, how in your heart, as a human being, you can possibly equate the things that you have said today, some of which are not true. There are 1,700 families and more in Pennsylvania, and these are the ones who've just dared to speak out about the neurological problems, the asthma, the cancers, the spontaneous abortions in their livestock. And you know this, sir. You know this is fact. This industry in which you and the government to which you are an advisor are deeply invested is ecocidal. Shame on you. Shame on you. And Okay. I want to know from you as a human being how you equate okay, that so this massive is, discrepancy in truth. And this is specifically on fracking, right? This is specifically on fracking where you assert, you, you believe there is a set of evidence that it has a set of harmful side effects. There right? is absolutely a set of right. evidence on all extreme okay, fossil right, fuel good. exploitation okay. techniques. Good. Now, the, the next person, if it is the same question, say it briefly because we're going to get an answer it, to it that. It is not the same question. Okay, Some good. Another clarity. question then, right? Uh, basically, uh, I would like to raise the point of this thing when Germany closes down and Japan closes down nuclear power stations, yep. Britain is building new ones on the coastline, and there's an inconsistency uh, of policy. Somebody demolishes the power stations and another one builds them. So there is an economic waste of money involved. However, my question as a CA Research Society president is this thing, that like ABC countries, Argentina, Chile, and Bolivia have pointed out that the Ronne and Rosse ice shelves are so showing signs of destabilization. How do you address the situation of building new power stations on the British shorelines if the sea level is rising by the tsunamis, by the storm surges, or collapsing ice sheets and ice shelves in Antarctica or Greenland after the sea ice and methane in the Arctic is coming out? Can I just be clear? This is a question about the siting of nuclear power plants in Correct. the light, in the light away of, from the sea, and in even the light of possible rising uh, uh, sea levels. That's right, and uh, I would like to say that in the eve of the, this recent IPCC AR5 report, Indonesia just decided that they are now looking into the possibility of relocating their capital size of London because they think that there is a 30 feet sea level rise by 2030. Good, okay. Good, well that's a good load of controversy to get us going. Um, John. <laughs> Can I first say, uh, I didn't talk about CCS, I didn't talk about many other technologies, uh, uh, all of which have a whole variety of risks and uncertainties associated with them. Right now, CCS is a very tough challenge to meet, uh, one which has not been on any scale other than very small, uh, been deployed successfully. There are many, many issues with that, uh, which can be read into all sorts of things that have been talked about already in the questions uh, posed to me this evening. Uh, its safety, its capacity, its capability, and so forth. So ideally, we want to try and do something to even avoid producing the carbon to store it away. Uh, you talk about water competition for shale gas, I completely agree with you. Uh, but I think you know, this is an area where uh, work has to be done to both use seawater, uh, partly desalinated, to use grey water, uh, as two areas of focus, and indeed, as I think technologies are developing, asking whether gas can be used as opposed to water uh, as the carrier of the propping agents to make fractures, nitrogen, for example, from the air. All of these things are not possible at the moment, but they probably will become possible with the right level of technology activity. So gas and different types of water. Now, madam, 
Uh, I, uh, if I've, uh, if I've patronised you, I, I apologise because I never have done that. I think to anybody uh, so far, and I've been around doing this for a long, long time. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, I want you to know that Quadrilla is not going to fracture in Balkan. It never has, and it's said it's not going to do that. It's drilled a well, uh, and it will, in fact, one day, I hope, test it to see what it's found. But it's not actually fracturing, uh, and it's not going to do that at Balkan. So uh, that, that's one thing, and I believe the company's already said that. Uh, I, I think that, uh, um, and so, uh, as a matter of fact, I believe, uh, as to fracking, there, there's plenty of discussion, and I've seen many of the studies, about what causes what and whether this is creating a problem for local communities. All I can do is rely upon the statements made by Ernie Moniz, who has said again, and I repeat again what I said, is that uh, as far as he's aware, looking at the whole of the United States, all the wells which have been fractured have not had issues to do with the fracturing. There have, however, I believe, been some issues to do with the leakage of gas, leakage of gas into aquifers as a result of imperfect operations, namely the cementing of well casing to the earth. And that has caused a problem, and that is something which I think everybody is now working much harder to get fixed. So that... Not quite, no, I don't think so. But they didn't fail that way, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, this is a matter of technical detail. I'm sure we can talk about it later. Perhaps I could do that in my... I'm a petroleum engineer, and we can have a go at it. But I prefer not to in front of the audience. Uh, thirdly, uh, because I think it's a matter... I'm sorry. I, I, I do. Uh, so, uh, let me pass on, if I may, with my apologies, if I have patronised you. I have no intention of doing that. Thirdly, on nuclear power. Uh, I think uh, there is a very big issue on nuclear power, uh, and it is, of course, to do with where best to put these uh, reactors, uh, and that's something which has to be looked at in terms of resilient infrastructure, but also about the cost. Uh, nuclear power has become very, very expensive indeed. And as I said in my talk, it seems to me that the more resilient it becomes, the more expensive it becomes, and therefore the less it's used. So we have a trade-off here. And I notice that even in the United States, where 25% of the nuclear reactors of the world exist, they're now being closed down, not for any other reason, other than they're simply too expensive to rebuild. But I, I was referring to the siting on the higher grounds because people are worried about chemical installations, no, I understand nuclear that. installations, yep. tsunamis and storm surges and collapse. I, I understand that. That's why I think it has to be a consideration for uh, resilient infrastructure. And, and I completely agree that infrastructure has to be made resilient to future changes in the geomorphology and in the way in which the, uh, the uh, coastline moves. Okay, we'll take some other, just one comment I'd like to make on the first and third of those questions. One thing that uh, uh, st uh, struck, a, a struck me uh, in those comments on carbon capture and storage and on nuclear, if I think of the different technologies that the Climate Change Committee looked at in 2008 and the cost that we thought would apply, there are two which have been disappointing and one of which has been beyond our wildest dreams. The two which have been disappointing in terms of their cost developments have been carbon capture and storage and nuclear. And meanwhile, solar PV has been, uh, had seen a, a cost fall uh, beyond our wildest dreams. I mean, what that illustrates is that even over five years' time, uh, there can be un, uh, significant uncertainties. Now, I'm going to go to the next set of questions, and I have quite a forest. Right, there's a gentleman up there, and then I think I'll go to... Um, oops... I'll go to this woman here, and then I'm going to go to the chap in the scarf over there, right? Yeah. Over there first. Thank you very much. Lord Brown, thank you very much indeed. I was really fascinated to hear, and I recognise your sincere concerns for the future of the climate, and I do mean sincere. I struggle, though, sincerely I struggle to equate that 
with your personal investments. Particularly when you come here and you tell the opposite of what we are able to read freely on the internet. You talk about human behavior. I'm in my 60th year. I didn't expect to be coming along tonight as a member of one of the campaign groups who's placed closely to Balkan, Frank Free Sussex, but I'm honored to be able to do this. So why do you tell us that there are no documented evidence of water contamination? May I quote you? Five lines. According to one report published in 2011 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, drinking water samples from 68 wells in the Marcellus and Utica Shale plays were contaminated with excess methane. The study found that average methane concentrations in wells near active fracturing operations were 17 times higher than in wells in inactive areas. Methane concentrations varied according to proximity to the drilling sites. Subsequent tests confirmed these findings. Reference available. I want to believe you, but I can't. Okay, now, second down here. So, Lord Brown, thank you for that. I'm Kimberly Henderson from the New Climate Economy Project. And I have a question that actually relates very closely to the title of your lecture. Um, as you pointed out, our main problem is really coal, and most immediately coal in China. Um, but right now we're seeing some amazing things in China. China's launching a carbon market. China's trying to tackle air pollution, all of which I think came as a bit of a surprise to a global, global community that's used to seeing China as a blocker. So I'm wondering if you think this might be a sea change? Sea change in Chinese policy, right? And the, who did I say that? The, the, the chap with the scarf there. My name is Jeremy Greenberg. I'm a master's student in the human rights program here. Uh, and my question's about safety. So um, this requires a bit of background, which probably most of you are familiar with. But uh, during your tenure at BP, we had an explosion in Texas at an oil refinery where 15 people died. Uh, then we have a series of oil spills in Alaska, millions of barrels of oil spilling into the uh, Arctic. Um, and it's been argued, I think, quite effectively that there's a direct line between your ruthless cost-cutting measures at BP and the safety failings at the Deepwater Horizon disaster, uh, which killed 11 people, and is, can, we continue to deal with the uh, cleanup in the Gulf of Mexico today. My question. Given this record of horrendous safety failures and your apparent lack of remorse for these failings, why should we believe your assurances now that in Balcom or in the Gulf of Mexico, where uh, you've also reinvested recently, that things will be different this time? John. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me go uh, back to your question. Uh, um, there are two different things going on here. One is fracturing, and the other one is water contamination. They aren't necessarily related. I think it's actually to do with the way in which the wells have been so-called completed. That is what I believe the studies are showing. Uh, and that is all I'm relying upon is, again, the Secretary of Energy of the United States, who has concluded this. That, so I, I think there's no way of actually saying which way, what's caused, what's effect. But I think that you'll find most of it's to do with the completion of the wells as opposed to the fracturing itself. Oh, mate, just very briefly. I think that that's Lizzie Hines, and you don't mention at all the vagaries of subterranean geology. Fissures, existing fissures, weaknesses which can be exacerbated Specifically through the okay. process of I, I agree with that. I'm trying to, uh, again, I, I don't want to go into this because I think there's no answer. I, I, okay. No, I, I, I don't feel that we're given the whole story, so we can't, as humans, behave as you want to. Thank you. But I want to say, again, I want to repeat again what I said. The United States Secretary of Energy has said he can't find a case. All I'm doing is repeating. John, can, John. No, can, can we just go? John, can I ask a clarification? Are you essentially saying that fracking is something that, as long as it 
is done effectively can be safe. I know there's a crucial phrase in, on your thing which says, as long as wells are designed to keep methane leakage to a minimum, and your argument is it is possible to do that rightly, which presumably then requires that you have a regulatory regime that, or whatever that and make sure that everybody does do it Absolutely. correctly rather than... That, that's your basic argument. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, and that's why I think we've been behind trying to get regulations that actually do create the possible probability uh, that this will not happen. Okay, now, come on, we're going to move on. There are other people ask questions, and other so people have got China, a right to ask questions on some other issues. Uh, so let's so move so on to the next one. John? China, uh, I, I agree. I mean, certainly something is happening. There's a lot to do. Uh, so there's a lot going on on low-level pollution, which is very important. Energy efficient intensity, it's been laid out in the five-year plan. Uh, people have been trying to get it implemented. This is a second go-round. I expect they will. And they've got different sources of hydrocarbons that probably they will make work, not least shale gas. Mm -hmm. Finally, on safety, um, I've, if I may, I've been in this discussion many times, uh, and let me just say this. First of all, uh, there is no relationship between cost-cutting and the particular incidents. It's never been proved. I don't agree with it, and that is that. Secondly, I think none of the, uh, I believe none of the actual uh, investigations proved that this was the case. Secondly, uh, I do not think, uh, I, I left BP in 2007, I handed over the reins on the 1st of January 2007, I think what happened during my tenure, I stand fully accountable for. I've said that before. Uh, what happened after my tenure, I can't possibly be accountable for. Uh, but I think all I would say is I think it's very regrettable, very sad, and something that we've apologized, I've apologized for personally, and I think the company has, uh, that these events took place. It's not good, I agree. Let me finally say that uh, the operations today uh, in the Quadrilla case of Quadrilla, are not being conducted by BP. They're being conducted by Quadrilla, uh, and I think no, no, none of the operating people come from BP. So we shouldn't trust BP now. But we no, I, I, I think that's. Oh, yes, yeah. um, could I, could I yeah, just could, say a word or say something on China? A word or two on China, because what happens in in China is so important to um, the whole future of bringing down emissions. And I had a long discussion in um, Warsaw at the UNFCCC with um, those who uh, advise and make energy policy in China. Um, it's likely that coal in uh, China will peak within 10 years. Um, I think that uh, the next target for China, rather than in terms of emissions uh, per unit of output, uh, is likely to be on emissions. Uh, and those, those two things will be a major step forward. So when I argued earlier that uh, we were only reducing uh, emissions per unit of output in the world as a whole by 1%, and we had to accelerate to 5% and hold it there for many decades, perhaps the best part of this century, I think the only people that I'm aware of who are seeing the scale of that challenge in a serious way <laughs> Is, is in China. Now, whether they can move fast enough, we're going to find out. They don't control the whole economy any more than uh, we do. Um, but I do think that uh, amongst the nations at the moment, they are unusual in seeing the magnitude of the, ch of, of the challenge and how fast we have to move. I mean, some of that, Nick, is I think the fact that a lot of their coal is now becoming really very expensive. Mm. to both uh, mine and move. And, of course, they're deeply concerned about the local contamination. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Now, I feel I ought to give it to somebody up there. There's a chap in a sort of uh, maroon, is it, a, 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 a jersey or something, in the middle there. Then I'm going to go over to the lady over there, and then I'm going to go right up to the far corner. There's a chap with a beard who I can see up there. Right. OK. Hi, thank you very much, Lord uh, Brown, for that uh, speech. Uh, I was wondering, 
How large do you expect fracking to be in the UK over the next 20 or 30 years in terms of output? And given that it's, from my expectation, going to be quite small, how do you expect the world gas mar market prices to be affected by shale gas worldwide? Okay, and the second one? Uh, thank you for, for coming here. I think for what it's worth, it's very brave. Um, it, despite not agreeing on you, with you with everything you said. Um, I think when we speak about China, I mean, we see that China is investing massively in solar, for example. But there's an incredible amount of hypo hypocrisy here because in the WTO, continuously, there are fights um, regarding, you know, feed-in tariffs with Ontario, with China, related to the production of solar panels between um, the West and uh, China. I mean, India has a national solar mission. There's no reason why, when we know fracking is more risky than solar power, it's futile to say you can design out the risk completely. We know that we have a safer technology that's far, fallen faster in cost. Why are we not pushing them to invest in it? Germany has shown that it's possible. Why are we not investing here? You are presenting us a second best option, and this is not a democratic debate. You are, all of this is, you're presenting yourself as, a, as an expert, and you're speaking with the lady here. This is not a demo, do, democratic debate. We deserve the best option, which is solar which is or solar. wind or other renewables. Right. The, the core of your argument is that solar is a better technology than gas and capable of coming down in cost faster. Yeah, that's the core yes, of your Yes, and a comment on the WTO conflict and the, other... The WTO, other this, is, this is on the, the, the dumping stuff in relation yeah. to, your, your, to, to China production, etc. Yeah, OK, good. And up there. David Evans, independent philosopher. <laughs> Yeah. You, you suggested that your own foundation will sponsor research into consumer psychology. That's fine, and I wish you good luck with that. One of the main problems about carbon reductions is that the great majority of people in Western culture are lacking the moral strength to do that. So I would like your research to look into that very issue that people lack the moral strength and how do you gain the moral strength whereas philosoph professional philosophers are usually talking about moral weakness and say nothing about moral strength so can your research look into that please right well i think everybody's looking forward to your answer to that one john uh, <laughs> so um, over to you well, let me start with the first one. It's easier. Uh, I don't know what the contribution of shale gas will be to the energy mix of the UK. Right now, what we need to do is to drill probably 10 or 12 wells, I don't know quite what the number is, and test them. This is called research. And this research needs to be done as quickly as possible. And on that basis, there'll be a much better and firm footing to say what it is. Say again? It's called blowing financial bubble. If you say so. It needs to be done as quickly as possible whilst the Tories are still in. No. No, just to, so that we know whether it's on or off, I think, really. Um, I, can we just let John answer uh, so the question? I, I think that's, that's that. Uh, it seems we're part of a well connected European gas market. Uh, and I think, unless it's a gigantic amount of gas, which fundamentally changes the balance uh, between uh, the production and uh, demand in the United Kingdom, it's not going to have a material impact on price, I don't think. But, but first, I think we need to establish what's actually there uh, and get that done. It takes effort and time to do that. Thank you for saying I'm brave. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> Compliments are rare, you know. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I think that uh, I, I would agree with you entirely that solar is a very good technology and we should use more of it. Uh, I think we should continue to improve it uh, because we have had 
the luck of very large overcapacity in production. Uh, and we need, I think, now to fundamentally change the way in which the uh, technology works. It's a very great thing. We need to make it work. Uh, I, I, many of you may think that I'm just in the business of uh, hydrocarbons. Actually, as I said in my speech, I, I run the world's largest uh, uh, renewable energy fund. It's very, very large indeed. And we're a very large investor in solar. The only problem is that it takes two to invest. It takes uh, the investor and it takes the overall financial environment. Every time we try and do something in solar, uh, someone pulls the rug from under our feet. Uh, and so we need, I think, a consensus here between business, which gets things done, and governments, which permit things to be done. So why are you not pushing for that? Because there's no yeah. way to say a massive well, I push am. for fracking is not going to no, no. take investment away from solar energy. I'm sorry, I, I'm actually pushing for both. Uh, because I think we need choices and mix here. We, we can't take, we're not yet at the stage, I think, I wish we were, uh, where we know what the solution is for the long term. You we should be a government advisor and head of quadrilla, mate. Yeah. It's corrupt. You're a fucking criminal. I think, can we leave out the expletives, please? Uh, That's you know. nothing. What no, no, come on, come on. Like, this is, this is, a, this is, this is a, we're having a good, robust debate, which we can have without, you know, expletives, etc. Let's just stick to, you know, the, the, the debate on the facts. Brown. Just stick. Look, excuse me, excuse me, sir. Excuse Look, look, we want questions. We want questions. Like, no, look, uh, this is not acceptable. There are other people who've asked. There, are, there is other people who've asked good, hard questions, quoting specific evidence, asking to get a response to that. That's the sort of debate we need, which comes back to the facts, not just you know abuse. Thank you very much. Right. Yes. Could you please calm this is down, a sir? Toxic legacy. Do you want to leave? Have you got grandchildren? Have you got any shame? Have you got any Look, I think. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Will you please sit down and allow us to have a free discussion, according to the principles of freedom of speech, where you deal with other people with respect, even if you disagree with them? No. Now, John, can you turn to the issue of moral strength? <laughs> I, I can indeed. I, I'm not a philosopher, and I'm not an independent philosopher either. Free, free planet! You're all corrupt! The whole government's corrupt! You're a bunch of fucking criminals! Would you please leave, sir? Now? I am! Fuck Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay? Fine. John. Thank you. I can't answer the question about moral strength. What I can do, though, in my experience, is talk a bit about leadership uh, and a bit about clarity. It, it seems to me that over the time when we've had a tough economic situation in the world, the climate change has definitely gone off many people's agendas. And that's not good, because it sends a signal to people that actually it's off, let's focus on something else. Keeping it on the agenda is part of leadership, and keeping it on the agenda in a convincing way so that members of business, as well as the electorate, really do actually believe that something actually needs to be done. I am in many conversations with many, many businesses where they say, well, that's very interesting, but actually it's off the agenda, isn't it? And you have to say, no, it's not. How can it possibly be off the agenda? It's just that people had to attend to something else for a few years. They're back. This, is, this has to come back onto the agenda. That's about leadership. I think that might be about moral strength, too. Can I, right. can I, can I add something on, on the question of moral strength? Um, public reasoning, public discussion of these issues um, is one way to start to uh, change people's understanding, not only of the evidence, but also of what's ethical. If you um, think of drink and driving, now, 
uh, when we were um, undergraduates, John, the, the drink driving legislation came in. And people saw it as, uh, many people saw it as uh, a grossly unreasonable restriction on human freedom and actually inequitable because the working man, they, they did mean a man usually, uh, had just got a car and was taking the car down the pub and the uh, police were going to be in the uh, corner <coughs> waiting for him to come out. Now I think now we'd see this as quite extraordinarily irresponsible. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we move from that kind of understanding to drink and of drink driving to the one that we have now where we see it as deeply irresponsible? And I think it's public discussion, laying out of the evidence, and there's a sense in which we're drink driving the planet. And if we can lay out the issues involved, the evidence and the alternatives, ways of doing things differently, then I think as well as changing the policy debate, we also change the moral debate. I think it's about consistency as well. Leadership consistency sends the right signal, again and again repeating. Right, now I'm hoping to get at least, well, another two <coughs> rounds before we close up. And there's a lady at the back, just in front of the independent philosopher. There's a chap in the, uh, the brown there who's been waving at me for some time. And then there's a woman over, oh, she disappeared. Somebody had their hand up, but you put it down again, right. Um, and I'll, go, I'll go for the, the chap in the red jumper then. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, Kavita Kopas, unemployed management consultant of several years. Um, I, I find it a little bit, um, I suppose, perplexing that you can talk about energy, um, energy policy and human behaviour um, in isolation. Um, how does it interplay with um, business planning, town planning, employment, and all the other structures that we have around us which drive <laughs> us towards more urbanisation, more consumerism, and um, more travel, all of which require more energy consumption, when really we should be looking at ways to design our lives which also reduces the amount of energy we consume? Yes, chat there. Nick has just asked me to ask students of the LSE to ask questions uh, in the last round. So can I stimulate uh, uh, such uh, hands? Though so how I will recognise them when their hands go up, I don't know. Right. Oh. Good. Yeah. Oh, right. Thank you, Lord Brown. Um, listening to your dissertation, one of the things that comes through to me is the number of different points where you, you almost infer tipping points across different uh, uh, energy supplies and the rest. Um, Bear, taking that in mind, bearing that in mind, there was a, a whole article in the Times fairly recently, which I had to write a reply to. Um, it was talking about Germany uh, decommissioning their uh, nuclear power stations. Um, and uh, the, the article largely was making the point they must be mad, obviously taking out that out of their mix of, uh, uh, of su energy supplies. Well, I, I, I wrote the reply to the letter and I basically referred them back to the, the fact that, if you remember right, in 1971 when we had the, the oil price shock, and if you remember rightly the, where we got one part of, uh, within 10 years, we got one part of energy, right, turning out three times the amount of product from there. So hence, my point I made to the Times was, no, no, if I've got the same details as you, but if I read it right, I'd say Germany is ahead of all of us. Thank you, Lord Brian. Uh, my name's uh, Richard Boyd. I'm an engineer at Arup. Um, and I was wondering if you could, the final point you made was about um, having public debates based on evidence, trust, um, evidence and trust. Um, and I was wondering if you could develop that further and perhaps answer the question of whether you think business has a role for uh, being more open or not, be more confident in being part of that public debate or whether it is something that is better left to politicians and other public figures. Thank you. John. So uh, uh, the first point is energy policy suffuses the entire economies, uh, not only of countries but also of the world and everything is related in every part to it. I think in the end, I, I look at it and say, the point about energy policy is there needs to be sufficient 
It needs to be affordable, it needs to be clean, and it needs to be there when you need it. And you've got to figure out how to do that in a way which takes the least amount of overall resources. And that's, I think, what everyone's trying to do. It looks chaotic, but that's what I think people are doing. I believe it's what every government aspires to do. They can't explain it very often, but that's what they're doing. I think in energy there are always tipping points, <clears throat> partly because it is a technologically based uh, industry, uh, and people figure out how to solve problems. Uh, and that's, I think, what is happening in Germany. Uh, they've decided against nuclear power. It's a widespread uh, uh, agreement. So they're trying to figure out how to reset the energy network. Uh, and I think they're doing some extraordinary things. Whether that will be the <coughs> result they want remains to be seen. You appreciate that I, I was referring to the fact that they can't increase their carbon footprint while at the same time taking out the, the uh, nuclear emissions. I said that's... I know, that's their, but today they've been announcing new, uh, revised, uh, reaffirmed, probably, targets for uh, more renewable energy. Let's Why can't we see. do that? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Why? I think it's something you should refer to people who can make those decisions. Who are your friends? <laughs> well, they're not all my friends, by any means. OK. Um, can we, yeah, and, sorry. Uh, sorry, public debate. I think the main point about uh, businesses is it's, they need to be at the table. They can't be the only people in the debate, but they need to be at the table because they're the people who've got the means whereby to deliver. And actually, that's what they do for a business. They deliver. So they need to be there. Uh, I, I doubt very much whether anybody uh, would wholly trust something uh, agreed to by business, invented by business, and executed by business without someone saying it's OK. Uh, and whether that's a regulator or whether it's a bigger debate, that, that's a matter of choice. OK, this is going to be the final round. I think I saw a lady over there in the third row, and then another woman about four rows later with a thing saying something uh, on your T-shirt. But uh, so, Oh, frack off. No, OK. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to ask a question, you're going to give us a new angle on it rather than the same one. And then I'm going to go for the chap right at the back in the middle. Right. OK. You. You, sir. Right. And that'll have to be it. Good. Hello. Um, so what we need is a very strong policy to create a low-carbon economy. The big elephant in the room is the lobbyists because we're trying to influence the policies globally, um, and companies like BP and Exxon and Chevron are going around saying, yes, climate change is happening, yes, we need to do something about it. But at the same time, they're part of you know, the church, like API and whatnot, and, and you saw it happening. Now, this is not an attack to you. I'm just kind of thinking about how we can influence this, because this is happening at a level that we don't know about, and it's incredibly powerful and much more powerful than what we can say to you or even to our Prime Minister. And I think we need to find a way around that. We need some clarity over what's happening at the lobbies level. Lady back there. Um, you say there isn't anything inherently um, dangerous with fracking. Um, I'd like to ask what you think about the, the 300 earthquakes in the last three years in Oklahoma, Texas and Pennsylvania. This is compared to 21 earthquakes previously in the 33 years prior to that. And um, I'd also like to ask you about the wastewater, which um, there's evidence to suggest that the wastewater injected back into wells is causing the earthquakes. So in 33 years, we had 21 earthquakes. We've had 300 in the last three years in areas where there's fracking. Okay. Good. Uh, can, I, can I just ask, is your question on fracking? Yeah, of course it is, yeah. Well, I'd like... I... <laughs> Sorry. I'd actually like to take, if you say it very quickly, in yep. which case I'd like to take somebody else, because I don't want this totally, there's so many other important issues as well, but very, very quickly, sir, if it adds uh, okay. at all to what... To be very quickly indeed, I uh, just want to go back to a line Lord Brown said earlier on, which is, you know, keeping climate change on the agenda is good leadership. 
There's many climate activists here who remember Copenhagen in 2009. And we know for a fact that lobbyists have much more power over these decisions than governments do. And I, I, I want to ask you, can you really put your hand on your heart and governments, particularly this government, have the well-being of this, this planet and the well-being of this species in the forefront? Or is it simply powerful people like yourselves with huge vested interests and it's corporate-led governments and it's nothing to do with the well-being of the people itself? Right, OK. I want... Because those are somewhat linked, I want to take one person who promises me that it isn't a question about fracking and it's moving us on to another issue. And I'm going to take the lady in the middle there. Yep. 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 You? You? Yep. Can you bring this? No, no. in the middle. In the middle. In the middle. Down here. Yep. Is what I said. Good. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm Alexia, student at LSE. Um, kind of steering away from the whole entire fracking issue, you mentioned geoengineering. Now, I'd like to hear a bit more about your thoughts on that and whether you don't think that would be steering efforts away from decarbonisation. Okay as you would kind of be, you know, just kind of obscuring the whole, like, the whole... Okay. Geoengineering. Very, very good, because it introduces a whole extra subject. Right, good. Right. John. <laughs> um, so, we clearly need policies for low-carbon economies. There is no doubt. I think that uh, I've been, and you may, you may say, how can you say that, I've always been very worried about the right way of lobbying. I do not... ...as much as possible on a fact basis. I think it's been an extremely good discussion. John, thank you very much indeed. Um... <laughs>